Well, good morning. It's a thrill to be with you here because I wasn't planning on being with you here. I did not know that I was on the schedule until uh, Thursday morning, but I'm thrilled to be here. This actually is a psalm that I was preparing to teach for you uh, the first Sunday of the new year, so in God's providence, you get it now. Psalm 138, a psalm of David that I thought would, would prepare our hearts for either the ending of the year or the beginning of a year. And so I'm going to give you my translation. Yours will be maybe uh, perhaps a bit different, but I will explain uh, as we go through the exposition. Uh, Psalm 138 of David. I give thanks with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name. For your covenant loyalty and faithfulness for your, you have magnified above all your name and your word. In the day that I called, you answered me. You made me courageous with strength in my soul. All of the kings of the earth will give you thanks, O Lord, for they will hear the words of your mouth. Now, here is a translation decision that I made. It, you may have not have the word will there in verse 4. I translate it will two times. This, you can take this verb uh, to give or to hear as a prayer. And so it would be translated like, all the kings of the earth will or may they give you thanks or may they hear um, the words of your mouth. I don't, it's perfectly permissible to take the verbs that way, but I don't, and I'm going to give you the reason why in the exposition. Uh, verse 5, and they will sing, here you are again, of what I would call future certainty. They will sing of the words of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Verse 6, For through the, though the Lord is on high, He sees the lowly. For the proud He knows from afar. That is very difficult. We read it, it seems so Simple to us, very difficult. Uh, Dr. Johnson told us students, you want to learn to preach and to teach? Take the hard text. This is a very hard psalm. Um, verse 7, I will walk in the midst of trouble. You will, there it is again, preserve my life, future certainty, and you will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, for your right hand will, will, not may, uh, not passive, not a request, but a future certainty. You will, and your right hand will save me. Verse 8, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me your covenant loyalty O Lord endures forever do not forsake the work of your hands the most important thing that you and I can do every day in a 24-hour day is to cultivate our relationship with the Lord however you go about doing that. But that should be our ultimate goal. To deepen our understanding of Him, to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him 
to think about Him. That's what I find in this psalm. I want you to notice the introduction, the personal I. Now, I is my translation, I count five. You may have four. Four or five, depending on the translation that you have. Let me give you mine. Verse one, I give thanks. I make music. Verse two, I bow down. I give thanks. Verse three, I cry out. So, what is the significance of the eye? It is personal. This is David's personal worship. Not leading a congregation. He's not taking the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem and dancing before the Lord. No. This is his personal worship. And this is the model that he is giving to us. So this opening, I give thanks. It's the same as Psalm 6, verse 5. Same word. You could translate it thanks or acknowledge. I confess. The idea of a crying out, a hearing publicly for others to hear. So when you get up and you give testimony and people can hear you, this is what David was talking about. It's the public acknowledgement to the Lord and being the gifted man that he is, he sets it to music. I sing thanks for what God has done in David's life. Now, it seems to me that we don't do enough of that. We go through life, we have challenges, and we have victories, but we just move on from them. And I think of how crass I was in my business experience. I'd buy packages of gas, several wells at a time, and rather than drop to my knees and thank the Lord for the daily bread that He gives me, I just high-five somebody and move on. Cultivate your relationship with the Lord by recognizing Him in worship. He is the one that causes you to do what you do, to prosper. That's what He, he basically says in Deuteronomy 8.18, Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gave you the power, the ability for you to prosper, to make wealth. And the purpose of doing that is He wants to conform, confirm His covenant to you. And that's what David's going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about covenant here. The way David understood it and the way we are to understand it today. And so David breaks into unbridled pra praise. Notice he is bowed down. Uh, that's his posture, verse 2. Uh, so what is the point? Well, the point is, it, it's what Willie Nelson taught us when he sang all of me. All of me, all of me, why not take all of me? Well, that's David. It's everything. It's his mind, his mouth, his posture. Everything is now centered upon his relationship to the Lord. His all in all, thoughts, voice, everything is engaged. That's worship. And we need to do the same. Don't blow off the meeting of the church. Think about it's an opportunity for you to give thanks and praise and worship in prayer, in singing, in reading of the Word, or hearing the Word. <clears throat> Invest in it. It's your relationship with the Lord. Cultivate it. Line two, we're told His praise is before the gods. That's small cap. Gods, Calvin and Luther, who read this psalm from the Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament in Greek, they understood it as angels because that's the way it was translated. And there is some support for that. Ephesians 3.10, the apostle tells us that the angelic host, powers and authorities 
are fellow learners of the wisdom of God. So it could be the idea of David giving praise to God in front of the angelic host. Um, This word before here is helpful. Uh, It's the same word that we found in Psalm 23 and verse 5. God preparing a table before David in the presence of his enemies. Often this word before occurs in the context of David's bowed posture or his worship at the ark. Remember, he didn't build the temple, so David would go to the tabernacle where the ark of the covenant would be located and he would be before that ark or that chest with the angelic beings on each side. Alan Ross, who is a very mean scholar of the inspired language, he, th- he takes the gods here to be a reference to the pagan gods from the kings in verses 4 through 6. The kings and the nations all worship false deities. And he references support from Psalm 95, verse 3. The Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. Psalm 96, verses 4 and 5. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So there is this theme of differentiation between the living God and the false deities of which the nations plead. I thought in a couple of myself, Psalm 135, 5. I know the Lord is great, greater than all the gods. Small caps. Psalm 136, 12. Give thanks to the God, the living God of all the gods. So, you have the idea of either David worshiping before the angelic host in his prostrated position, or he is, in fact, doing what we do at Believer's Chapel, worshiping the Lord in the midst of a pagan and darkened culture and environment. The location of the worship, holy temple, holy place, that's the tabernacle, Look, the word holy here emphasizes something that is hard for us to realize. We intellectually embrace it. Holiness, yeah. It's sanctification, yeah. It's separation, yeah. But what does it mean? We don't know what it means. We have these phrases Holy, holy, holy. What does it mean? How about dropping down into the ocean and interviewing a fish? Uh, Tell me what you think of a sunset. A mountaintop experience. You ever ever seen the setting of a sun? The clouds, the sun rays refracting through the clouds, the prism of light. Well, a fish wouldn't know what you're talking about. Not part of his experience. Doesn't know anything about it. That's holiness. It's, it's his perfection. It's his marvel. He is other. That's the best way to describe it. And uh, notice it is focused for our help and for David's, upon his name. You see that? Name is a common designation for the nature, the essence of the Lord, the covenant name, the voice of the burning bush, uh, which we have emphasized a lot in our study of the Proverbs. Name to us in the Western culture, the Western man, it's a label. It's an identification. It's a summons to memory. It brings us history. And it brings us instant recognition. If I were to say to you, Warren Buffett, you would probably have positive thoughts. You'd certainly have the thought of money. 
But if I were to say to you, Adolf Hitler, your thoughts would be completely different. Uh, we've tried to emphasize in Proverbs 22.1, the protection of your name, the protection of your reputation. We build these giant financial institutions to protect our money. Banks to hold the money. In the world, what is their attitude? They could care less about their name and reputation. Just look at who I am and look at my money. My money. Money. It's power. It's authority. I set the rules. I have the money. But not in the Proverbs. It is your name that is more valuable, say the Proverbs, than your money, than silver and gold, what you are. He points our attention through the name to two attributes. Look at this. Uh, the name is the essence of who God is. We don't think like that. We think of it as an identification point. But David saw it differently, and we need to think about it differently. Name is his essence. And from his essence come his incommunicable and communicable attributes. Communicable ones we identify with. Jealousy, love. Incommunicable, his sovereignty. His immutability. We don't identify His holiness. We know that they are there and they're true, but we don't identify with them. They're, part, they're other than the human experience. But look how David uses the name of God. Psalm 54, verse 1. David in a crisis cries out and says, Save me by your name. That's uh, remarkable. It's who God is. It's what He is. His name is who He is. And so he points and references to two words. The first, you and I are familiar with, hesed, loyal love, covenant loyalty. It is a close encounter from the third kind because it cannot be defined or explained in any language of the world. It is other it has come from heaven down to us, and we can't quantify it. We can't identify it. We can just try the best we can to explain it. And so we're going to attempt to do that here. His covenant faithfulness means He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We do that all the time but not God. No, He pledges His loyalty to us. How does He do that? Because He loves you. And I can't explain that anymore to you. Why He loves you. Why He loved me. I can't explain it. It's other. But it's true. And God's pledge is that nothing can sever that. Paul, I think, tries to explain to us Gentiles what covenant faithfulness is in Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, principalities or powers, nothing, can, nothing present or things to come, height, depth, nor any creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. That is covenant loyalty. As best we can get our brain around it. Here's the second word, faithfulness. The root of the word is to be firm, reliable. It's used of a peg supporting a tent, holding it firm to the ground. So I put these two words together as we often do in the Scriptures. And we see them. Uh, Exodus 34, 6-8. The marvelous revelation of who the Lord is. Here He is. The Lord put before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, merciful, gracious, 
God, slow to anger, abounding in covenant loyalty and faithfulness. That's who He is. That's what He is. And God keeps His loyalty. So I think of this logically as God keeping His loyalty because by nature He is firm and reliable. Permanent. You cannot get away from Him. These last two lines here are very, very personal to me. I'll never forget them. I was at the Waterford Hotel in Oklahoma City drinking coffee with James Boyce, and he said, you know, Alistair Begg, he has that radio introduction to his program, and he references, you have magnified over all your name and your word. Do you know where that's found? And uh, I said, well, I, I've heard Alistair Begg, I've heard the verse, but I'm drawing a complete blank here, Dr. Boyce. Yeah, well, and uh, now Dr. Boyce is in heaven, and uh, he is in unapproachable light, and he knows this verse far better than anybody could ever explain it. And I'm still here, dumber than a sack of nails, and frustrated that I never answered his question. Well, here it is. Here's this verse. Let's. It, the, the Hebrew is so complex, and I don't want to get into in, the inspired language and the difficulty here. Uh, I'll just go to Derek Kidner, the brilliant Cambridge scholar. And Kidner says, here's the verse, The Lord's fulfillment of His promise to David surpasses all other manifestations of His works. Now, when you say works, you're talking about all the creation. So, what is this great mind of Derek Kidner said? He said that the promises of David are more important to him than anything that he knows or understands. And I got to thinking about, why wouldn't that be? You remember, uh, you remember the calling of David, the anointing? Samuel comes, and all the sons are there. Jesse's got, here's my pride and joy. Here's my, oh, I love, you love this guy. And David wasn't there. He thought so little of David, he didn't bring him. And then here comes this kid. And Saul, Samuel anoints him. And what does he say? You're going to be the king of Israel. Don't despise the day of small things. His whole career is built on promises. I would put right here in your verse, in my margin, Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. This ending word supports Kidner's thought, I think. In it is so different than the normal word that we have in the Old Testament we would be expecting a word that we constantly come across referencing the Word, the Word, the Word. But this is different. This is from the root to say, which would be emphasizing the Lord's activity of voicing or the product of a word. So David says, Basically that here is what I mean. My life experience validates His promises. And so does yours. Where'd you come from? What hell hole did He dig you out of to find you and to make promises to you 
and embrace you. Oh, my friends, give thanks to the Lord of praise. Verse 3, the reason for the praise, in the day I called, you answered me. Day in the Western mind is so different than David's. We think of calendars. We think of schedules. We say 2 o'clock Thursday afternoon. That's the way we talk about day and time, specific. But in the Hebrew mind, it's whenever. Whenever what? Well, look. You see, called. We studied, talked about that word. We've discussed it many times. Calling. It was associated with Abraham building his altars, calling on the name of the Lord. So what is calling? It is worship. It is fellowship. It is a reminder that He is with you always and never will leave you and never will forsake you. It is worship. So call on Him. And you're going to find Him there. And often, my friends, He's closer than your skin. And look what he does for David. Provides courage and strength. That's supernatural vitality. People say, how did you do that? Peter, whatever gave you the crazy idea to walk out on that water? That's the dumbest thing I ever saw. But he did it, didn't he? And no one else in that boat did, did they? Believe what He says. Lord, if that's You, bid me to come. What did Augustine teach us to pray? Command what You will, will what You command. If You command it, You'll will the power to do it. And so, Peter did. Call on Him. Call on Him. Call on Him often. Call on Him regularly. And He will arrive. Not at 1.30 on Monday, but He will arrive at His time, at His place, and His significant arrival for your experience to show you His faithfulness. Isaiah 65.24 Before they called, I will answer. That's our word to call. Right here, verse 3. We're in a new section, verse 4, all the kings of the earth shall give you thanks. David's attention turns to the prophetic word. Now regarding the nations, it's an interpretive question regarding these verbs that I talked about in the translation. You can translate them as a prayer. I don't do that. I understand this as David speaking of a period of time in the future that has not yet come upon the earth. And here's why I believe that that's the case. It's just exactly like Psalm 2, the style that David uses. He opens the psalm, Psalm 2. Why, why, why do the nations rage? Why do they imagine vain things? And then verse 3, he immediately goes into a prophetic word regarding a conversation among the kings. So here... He has given us His personal worship, and now He moves into a prophetic word without any sort of trans- transition whatsoever. Now, look at this language. The day will come when the kings of the earth will give you thanks, praise, worship in your covenant name. What's that mean? That means relationship. Hearing the word of His mouth. To hear is to believe. Jesus said, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, Pharaoh heard. Moses and Aaron marched right in there. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. He heard. He didn't believe. I don't know the Lord. Good answer. King Agrippa, Acts 26. He heard the Apostle Paul's testimony. It was so powerful and persuasive that Agrippa said, in this short amount of time, you almost persuade me to take off these royal robes and crown and come down there and be with you. But he didn't. 
And now he's had all these centuries to grind over that statement. I didn't. Persuaded, but didn't. You see, to hear is to really believe. Believe the Scriptures. Verse 5, as a result of their hearing, in verse 4, they now break into spontaneous worship, singing of the ways of the Lord and praising His glory. Imagine that. Now, here's my question. When has that ever taken place in the earth? When has that ever happened? Can you imagine Putin leading us in singing this morning? Let us all stand and praise the Lord together, he would say. Never happened. This is a prophetic future. This is a time in the future to come. And I believe that it will happen on this earth in space and time. Glory. It's a broad expression. I have a friend that doesn't say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He just says, glory, glory. And that's great. Because, see, glory expresses all of God's attributes above and beyond all. And you see that 4 in verse 5? David's going to give you an explain, his explanation of glory from his own experience. And here it is. The amazing grace of God. I took you, said the prophet, from the sheep pens, and I made you king. That's amazing grace. How do you describe amazing grace? We all came someplace. We all encountered the Word of God someplace. Everybody has their own Damascus Road. What was yours? Here's John Newton's amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found, was blind and now I see. What's yours? We all have one, don't we? Verse 6, although the Lord is on high, the word means exalted. Found in Psalm 46, verse 10, the Lord is exalted among the nations. And being on high, he sees the lowly. A reference to the status of men. He sees them. You know, Dr. Barnhouse had an illustration of the way God looks at men and the way men look at men. And he had a video camera down on a sidewalk from a high skyscraper, and he says, while you look at men walking up and down the street, you have no idea of their size. They all look the same from this point of view. But when you get down on the street, there's one six foot five and one five eleven and one six three and one six two. You See, all different sizes. Because men measure men differently, but when God sees them, He sees them all the same. They all are the same to Him. What's He talking about here? Well, men can't extricate themselves from their many oppressors. Let me give you David's oppressors. His health. He talks about it often in the Psalms. Oppressed by those who desire to ruin him, kill him, eliminate him. Oppressed by his family. You've been oppressed by family where you are in the congregation of David. I have a friend that attends the Friday morning Bible study I have in Oklahoma City. And his son right now is in Iraq. He's a Marine. He's a decorated Marine. He led the troop to guard Camp David for a period of time. And now he is in Iraq as a Marine. And he is surrounded by enemies. So that he, they have to take the Humvee out 
and their weapons locate, uh, loaded every time they leave the compound. And the compound is giant. They're surrounded by enemies. It's quite a bit different than our own experience here. But he said to me, my son will be able to relate to this verse. See this verse, verb in verse 6, to see. He sees the lowly. It's used in the Old Testament for evaluation. He watches you in oppression. The Lord God is aware of the pressures that are applied upon you. And what is the point? Well, He will in His own place, in His own time, in His own providence, He will come and He will deliver you and He will rescue you. And for some, that might be death. But He will be there and He will come and we'll find Him. On the other hand, He knows the proud man from afar. Now, to know is not difficult. His knowledge is all comprehensive. But He knows men differently. That's the point. They're not all the same. One like David, he knows closely. The other at a distance, meaning they're not near. It has nothing to do with time and space. It's intimate knowledge. We would say, I know the King of England. But you really don't know him. You don't know him personally. You know him. You're not close. Well, God says, to my chosen one, my faithful ones, I'm close. I'm real close. And so we think of a text like James 4.8 where James instructs us, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. And then in that verse, he talks about purification. And James is thinking about Old Testament purification. You had to go through all this right and legality under the law to be purified and declared pure. But James says, no, this is not like this. We're no longer under the law. This is the purification right here. And how do we do that? John tells us if you confess your sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive you your sins. We have an advocate with the Father. We have a powerful attorney who pleads our case. Jesus Christ the righteous. He'll plead our case for us. You can trust Him in that. If we confess, He is there to deliver. And He will deliver. And He will keep us pure. You see, those He knows from a distance are people that don't need that. They don't need purification. They don't need cleansing. Hey, I'm a good guy. I'm a good man. What does good mean? It may be good before the eyes of men. It may be good before the eyes of the government. You pay your taxes. You obey the law. But are you good before the eyes of the living God? He demands perfection. Perfection. That's what He demands. You see, the self-sufficient man wants to approach the living God on His own terms. Can you imagine? On His own terms? That's man-made religion. Uh, come in here and only confess in this confessory to another human being my sins. And He's going to give me forgiveness. And He's going to tell me 25 Hail Marys and nine burnt candles and so on. What idiotic. Man cannot cleanse another man. There is only one that cleansed you. The God-man Himself. And He is eternal. And He was God. 
The ways of men are opposed to the way of God. What is your relationship? Right here. Right here in the heart. He closes, verses 7 and 8. Here's the confidence for you in all your tomorrows. You see, living in this life, we're vulnerable. We learned that with COVID, didn't we? We're vulnerable. We've got all kinds of weaknesses. Achilles heels everywhere. Now, David here, writing the psalm, he's not in trouble, but trouble for David is just like you and me. It's always around the corner. But look, he remains confident because the Lord is going to preserve him. Very confident. Uh, Paul put it this way, Philippians 1.6, being confident that he who began a good work will finish it. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And he is going to make you like Jesus Christ. That's the end product. Look at this interesting way he expresses that God will stretch out his hand. That's anthropomorphism. God doesn't have a hand. But think of the hand. Um, Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. There he makes the hand the acts of providence. Um, he tells the man with the withered hand, set forth your hand. Well, he can't do that. It's withered. Well, guess what? Our lives are withered. We're all withered. But step forward. Believe His Word. And you'll accomplish the task that He set before you. This word perfect, verse 8, perfect that which concerns me. It's His purpose. Not my purpose for you. His purpose for you. It is now His life reproduced in you by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. That's what He's doing in you and through you. To be all that He has called you to be. What has He called you to be? Here's my list. I'm grandfather, I'm father, I'm husband, I'm mentor, I'm friend. He's called me to be all of those things to the best of my ability, trusting Him. My New Year's resolution is to be the best that I can be under the grace of God with a little that I have. Look, he's talking about hands. Look how he closes it. We're the work of his hands. He's not through with you. Hands, hands, he's got busy hands. He's never going to let you out of His hand. He is going to accomplish the purpose for which His hands made you. And He will bring you perfect and complete by His hands to be the man, the woman that He made you to be. So what's the overview of the psalm? Here it is. It starts with David's personal worship. And he does that by the study of his word. That's his prophetic word to us. Know it. Understand it. And it moves logically to sanctification. Being set apart for his purpose. For his glory. Not yours. To be all that He is determined for you to be. That's the psalm. To God be the glory. Look at you. You're a miracle. A miracle walking among us. 
And God is glorified by your steps. In eating and drinking and all that you do, you bring glory and honor to Him that called you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for Psalm 138. So difficult. So hard. The inspired language. We, we seek to study it as best we can. But we know ultimately what it means. It means that all of our lives are to be lived to the glory of God. It's the chief end of man. It's all about you. And none and nothing about us. In this time and space that you've given us to live. Glory be to God. Glory. In Jesus' name, amen.